that you have to you have to bring them in you have to you i think you're you're seducing the reader line by line by line and the first one is the most important hello writers and crafters i'm valerie isan and i'm eric mertz and it is episode 154 of the podcast and it's april 24th 2024 as we record this there's a lot of fours in that line <laughs> <laughs> today we're lot. talking it's like about this palindrome week it's palindrome yeah. week like it's yeah today we're talking about openings first lines and hooks for your book we want to thank you to our existing patrons for believing in our work offline and here in the podcast become a patron of the arts at patreon.com slash valerie isan for books writing instruction coaching and planning and patreon.com slash strange air stories for short stories in the paranormal mystery genre announcements uh, Pacific Northwest inspired horror stories, caretakerpress.org. Eric is starting. There's a lot starting... of stories in that queue. There's a lot of There's stories. There's a lot of stories. Queue. Please, please add to that queue. If you are, if you're out there and you are sitting on a story, please. Yep. Submissions the, open until the, the stories are filled. They're going to start reading May 1st. So get it in there before May 1st, if you possibly can. Uh, you can also go to ValerieIsan.com slash retreat because the 2024 Writer Craft Writing Retreat and Workshop registration is open. And I have put out on the retreat page all of the workshop titles and blurbs. So I did a little bit of thinking about what I wanted to, to teach at the um, workshop at the retreat. So go have a look there. And um, my book, Three Story Method, Writing How-To Books, is out now. And also, ba -da -ba -da -ba, thank you, Eric, for lighting the fire. Focus and finish goal setting and strategic planning for writers is now up on the stores, perma-free. Actually, the Amazon oh one still says 99 cents. I have to. They haven't, right. uh, they haven't it picked says it up it's, yet. It's, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it'll say 99 cents. But then it'll like it'll have it. It's it's ninety nine cents, but in their in their metrics, it's ninety nine cents, but discounted. So okay. Yeah. Well, I I might still have to like email them and be like, hey, can you price <laughs> match? And then and then eventually it'll just say zero, I think. But yes, it should be up on all the sites. That's terrific. Those are the announcements. Uh, we don't have any listener comments or questions. If you guys have comments or questions, we love getting that mail. You can go to writercraftpodcast at gmail.com and uh, pop in any questions or comments or leave a review on the podcast. We'll read those out. So yeah, we like to hear from you. It makes it more of a conversation. We want to, hear. We want to know what you're doing. <laughs> what are you doing? What's your author update? Well, tomorrow I go to... Colorado for the Pikes Peak Writers Conference, Jazz Up Your Writing. Um, so yeah, it's a weekend conference. I'll be teaching something every day and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm kind of excited and it's just, I, love, I love the idea of getting out of town. I love the idea of, of being in a big group of writers I've never been before. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm excited for that. Um, but in and around that, I'm finishing, so Dead Still, which is the introductory novella for my new series, is up. It's in pre-sale form um, on Amazon. You can find it there for 99 cents. Um, that's the pre-sale price. Um, I am now like pretty close to finishing the rewrite of the first, the second book, the first you know, longer full length book. So that should be done here. Probably finish it over the weekend. So wait, wait, wait. So last last week you said the revision of book three was happening, but book you're two. now you're saying book two is almost done. Or was that book did I write it down wrong last no, week? No, book two book two. Yeah, I think book two revision is nearly finished. Um and so that's yeah, I should be done with that over the weekend. And I think once yeah. I think I think once I get home, I'll be planning the pre-release for that. So, 
Do you have I'm a title for that? Yet? Title for uh, that one. I'm still working on the title. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> title. The titles are hard. Like I want to stay away from the like. I want to stay away from the the sort of branded title that I've done before. Everything has the word shadow in it. Not because I don't like. I think it's fun when you see a series that does those sort of things. You know, what is it? M is for murder. N is for you know, whatever, like night or whatever that book series, it's kind of cool, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it takes the joy of, out of discovering the title away. That's yeah. what I, that's what I'll say. Mm -hmm. And I really, I really, I liked coming dead still. I loved coming when I figured out that was the title. It was, it was a eureka moment. Um, I love that feeling. So I'm just, I'm not going to get that with this series. Um, uh, it, it, I'm not going to get that with with this series unless if if I tie myself to a title uh, logic. So yeah, usually my now titles. Have... Go ahead. Sorry. No, now that you I have what? Say, I'm just. I want to be free. I want to be free of like <laughs> rules around my titles. <laughs> break free. I want to break free. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm um, testing out the title "The Accidental Stranger" because I I like it. Oh. it there's a time travel element. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of idea is that the main character is a stranger in the new town he goes to, not just a stranger in like a new place, but in a new time. Mm. And thus, I dig that. Thus far, the time travel. El you like the accidental stranger? Yeah, I dig that. That's cool. I was gonna say the way I get my titles usually is after I write the book. And I'm going through the, um, I don't know, I look for a little phrase in the book that really pops out that has kind of a poetic tinge to it. And that usually right. ends up being the titles for me. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, that's normal. So normally the title for me comes right off the like, I know immediately what the title is. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, it's, it's that simple or it comes way at the end of the writing. Like it mm -hmm. comes somewhere like where I am now. So it's a familiar place to be. Um, I, I do this brain title brainstorm. Like I always have like a little notepad of just ideas, like for things like that. And I wrote down the accidental stranger. And although I didn't commit to that title, I did, it was hard to come up with other titles after that because I thought, well, this that is one's got edges that and... snag on you. Yeah. You're like, oh, oh, I like that. And one. there's no one on Amazon who has that title that I've seen. So I've, I've searched the title out. I haven't seen it. So who knows? We'll see. All right. Cool. Uh, how's your website design going? Have you been tweaking on it? Or is I'm, it done? I'm building landing pages as we okay. speak. I'm actually floating those to my designer today. That's one of my to do things before I leave. And then hopefully, so land, like I'm making exclusive landing pages for ads. Um, that's the way uh, I think ads run the most effective, at least according to my digital marketer. So he he's requested me to create some, pa some pages. So we're going to do those pages now. We're going to start testing those out probably next week. And then, yeah, we're going to be using the content from this conference throughout the uh, yeah, we're going to be using the the, the, the content from the, the conference throughout. Um, we're going to record most of my seminars. We're going to be, you know, putting them out there on social media. So I'm hoping to start doing more of that. Mm -hmm. So that sounds cool. Stay. You'll have to, yeah, stay tuned. I want I want to know about that stuff and how to how to do it too. I see all these people doing like reels, uh, like clips from podcasts. I only just started doing teasers for our podcast, Eric. <laughs> I'm so behind on all of the fancy <laughs> and how do you get yeah. like the, you know, when you, when I scrolling through Instagram, I don't have the sound on. I hate when like sound accidentally comes up. Cause I'm usually like surreptitiously scrolling when I'm like waiting for something or bored in a class or something like that. Right, right. So I love it when there's like little video clips that have like the, the closed captioning, but I don't right. know how to like, turn that on or do you have to like write out the script and upload it with your video like I don't know how to do that part and 
and right. how to streamline it. So that I think would be cool to put up a clip, you know, like maybe even from our podcast like this when we're talking. And then I have that be on Instagram. I think that's yeah. I that's exactly when you say that, I'm like, that's that's the the special sauce to me that I don't know how to do. Um I wouldn't even know what to identify in. That's one of the things my digital marketing person has mm -hmm. said. Like we're going to identify, we're going to, I'm going to take each of those hours of video and I'm going to, I'm going to identify what, you know, what's really the, what's the best, um, what's the best stuff you do mm -hmm. in what there. Like, I yeah. don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm going to talk for an hour. I'm not going to know anything about what the best stuff is to be truthful. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be up there talking and people are going to be hopefully listening <laughs> and I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it works. Well, I think it's, I, I, I truly think that it's one of those, like this digital marketing stuff. It's just going to be one of those things that for me, this is my sense of it. I'm going to come across the other side in three months after having somebody doing this and, and I'm going to see how it works and it's going to, I'm going to say, Oh, okay. Like it's, I think there's going to be a eureka moment because for right now, like for right now, it's all very, it's, it's all very vague. Like you said, like, I, I, how do I make this real? How do I put the captions on it? How do I make sure I pick the right stuff? Where do I put it? Uh, I mean, it's all, <laughs> I'm sure the it's mystery gonna is be not a, that You're, you're going to have a system. He, he's going to set you up and he's going to tell you how to do it. And you'll have a checklist and then you'll know how to do yeah. it. Or maybe yeah, you'll just yeah. have him do it. Whatever. Maybe you'll try it a few times and think, not worth my time. <laughs> you know, I'll pay I someone else truly, to do it. <laughs> you know, I told him like our goal is if we're if we're making money here, if you're making me money, then I will continue to let me. I, I'll continue to pay you to make me money. That should be the way this works. So he mm -hmm. has an incentive, and I said there's a lot more where this came from. Like I have many ideas, many projects, many things. So let's you know let's build let's build it. Mm -hmm. Let's build it. Build it, and they will come. That makes me yeah. want to watch that movie again. <laughs> I love that movie. I have to stop myself from watching that movie. <laughs> well, I got a new printer. Yay! That's great. <laughs> and you got a new computer. That's... Yay! Uh, yeah, new computer, new printer. Um, I printed out all the things finally. So I had like two contracts that I was supposed to sign like months ago. <laughs> so I finally oh, printed gosh. out the contracts. And then I can uh, sign them and mail them back. And uh, I published a book, that Perma Free book. That's going to be first in series. So uh, book two is actually already half written, just with repurposed content, speaking of which. So uh, so that one is going to be, the working title for that is Strategies for Authors. But that's, you know, boring. Cool. I'll come up with something a little bit different. I mean, the boring no, part, I think, boring. should be in the subtitle because it's got to be SEO friendly, right? <laughs> but the actual title, yeah, I yeah. like it to be a little more pithy and or yeah. more, not poetic, but just something more interesting than strategy You mean it has to be like authors. a first line. It has to be kind of like a hook. It's kind yeah, of like... I kind of like that. More on that later. Yeah. What are you reading? Absolutely. Still working on the Institute. Okay. I finished, I, just, I finished you worthy. Finished, what did you finish? I finished worthy. I finished uh -oh. dead still. I'm working on the beta read right now. I'm only like a quarter of the way through. It's a really, 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 really long book. <laughs> mm. So I will be probably chipping away at that a little bit. And um, in the meantime, I think I've, I've picked up thunder songs by um, Sasha Lapointe. She wrote red paint. She's the native writer mm. from Washington state. Mm. Um, she's a poet and has, she has a book of poetry out that I did not purchase, but I like essays. So Thunder Songs is her personal essays. And, and of course I love memoir. So Red Paint was a fabulous memoir. So if you're looking for a memoir read and you've That's already finished mine, <laughs> <laughs> Start. then go with uh, Sasha LaPointe's uh, Red Paint so yeah I'm uh, Thunder Songs that's the that's the book that I'm reading now cool Thunder Songs I'll have links to all these in the show notes as ever all right well 
we should talk about first lines and hooks and and beginnings, openings. There's let's def let's define broadly too. When we talk about okay. first lines, uh, I think you talk about first lines in a book. I mean, that's sort of the classic. If you read um, Poets and Writers mag magazine, um, there's a, a little there's always a little um, section of first lines of new releases. Mm -hmm. um, so first lines are classic, you know, everybody remember people remember them. But I also think we think there's something to be said for first lines to chapters, first lines to scenes. They are in they are no less important than the first line to the book because. That first line is the reader is picking up the book and saying, am I going to con read this book? Let's see. Oh, that's first line's great. I'm hooked. But now in this world where we're competing as authors, we're competing with movies and you know Netflix and what's on the phone and doom scrolling and the news and all these things, you have to entice that reader to keep picking the book up, right? So they, yeah. they, they read the first two chapters. They love it. That first... <laughs> first line of that next chapter has to be great because I think you're always rehooking the reader from their other distractions. So like think the principles apply throughout the, the manuscript. Also first lines in scenes are really important um, just logistic wise. So often you're reading a book with multiple POVs and that is the opportunity at the beginning of the chapter or even arguably the beginning of a scene if you're hopping around in your chapter with different POVs to really clearly state, you know, whose head you're in when you're reading. Right. Usually right. by, you know, the name or like the thing they're doing in that first sentence so that the reader can clearly land in the scene and know exactly, you know, who they're reading about right now. Otherwise, right. where they are. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. so annoying to me to like, be reading and think I'm in, you know, character A's head. And then like even three sentences in, I find out it's not, it's somebody else. I'm like, it really stops me. I have to like pause, rewind, reread, you know, <laughs> it's like the old VCR, like what, <laughs> what's going on here? And every time, every time you ask the reader to do that, you you risk losing them because readers don't want to have to do the work. Well, yeah, I mean, and it totally breaks, to brings you out of the out. story. I want right. to be immersed. Yeah, and it's it's a challenge. I mean, it's really a challenge to, and also I think another thing is in a in a manuscript of any length, let's say it's even a three scene short story. I think you have to vary your introduction, your your opening lines, so that you're not, you know, kind of strumming the same beat every time. I. I find that when I read uh, either as a writer, as a part of my reading group, my sorry, my writer's group, or I'm reading as part of uh, something I'm editing for a client. One of the things I'll return to is this idea that like, give me different openings. You can't always open with a description of the sunset, or you can't always open on cold dialogue, or you can't always open, you know, with a sort of poetic line, you know, so sort of a la classic literature, you have to vary those approaches because, and watch a movie, you watch a movie, like every time a scene opens, it doesn't always open the same way. Um, so is it just to prevent to, to boredom? Have... Is that why? I think it's, to pre I think so. And I also think there's an element of expectation that you're trying to subvert expectations all the time. Right. If the first scene begins with a description of the sunset and it ends with a car door slamming, um, you know, you, you've given the reader some finality to that scene. Car door slam sounds like the end of something. You want to mm. open with a, a variation uh, with, 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 with a variation of a scene opening. Sorry, a, a version of a scene opening that. You know, signals to them, we've moved on, we've moved on, we're in a different place and. Mm -hmm. and to keep them interested because if you keep repeating those beats it just gets yeah it gets really tedious and really boring and and it starts to feel like the writer i think when i read that when i read mm. manuscripts for people i'm like this sounds like the writer is like doesn't know what to do here um so repetitiveness yeah if, if it becomes repetitive it becomes boring the reader loses interest and or breaks them out of the storyline because you think, oh, this is author intrusion. 
Yeah, and I think there's the uh, there's the temptation to like consider that like motif, like oh, this is just what I do. Everything opens with the sunset, or and it mm -hmm. might be you know if you're writing some, I don't know, environmental sci-fi that changing sunset is part of the story, and the reader will be clued into that, or it might be. I don't know. I think, I think of things that like people where people try to just create some stylistic um, elements that are uniquely there and that might work, but you have to be very purposeful and intentional about that. Or there's a big difference. There's a small difference between like it working and really not working. So you have to be careful. I think there's a finer line than most people think, to be honest. Hmm. Well, that, I, I, I have think questions it's just, about that, but now I wonder if this is the right place for it. <laughs> well, no, I think it is. What, what, what are the... Just the, you know, that that line between the stylistic element working and totally not working, like where, I guess for me, that would just be the repetitiveness or like if, if you're trying for symbolism, you know, like the heavy hitting over, you know, I said that totally wrong hitting them over the head with the symbolism. Like right. if you're putting it in the first line of every chapter, like that's right. maybe not where to put it in. And maybe that's too often anyway. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to quote a, an editor that I had um, a while ago who worked on a book of mine. And, and she said, why do you keep bringing up these you I'm, I'm talking about you. If anybody didn't figure that out, I mean, I was really big on putting, and, and this isn't exactly what I mean, but I had like a, a, a time, I would timestamp the beginning of chapters to keep the reader oriented to the beat, like where I, where we were in the story. Oh, I remember this. And it, <laughs> yeah. And you said like, it really takes me out of the story because I, 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 I keep thinking this is like a landmark time and it really, it really matters. And I realize like, oh, this is like, I I look at this like kind of like a true crime story where you see the date kind of on the bottom of the screen, but it it doesn't work for everybody that way. I just think you you might you I it was a very fine line. Like to me, I thought it mattered it and I thought it worked. And you said it didn't, it took you out. So I think those are the kind of things that like it it just didn't work. There's a fine line. Now, now I timestamp things that are like landmark dates in a story or landmark dates in a in a manuscript um that are I think it works to too if you just put like if you're trying to especially if you're working with two different timelines like yes if you're reading two different timelines then the year makes a lot of sense to me right. or like the season right. you know fall or w whatever right. but if it right. has a specific date to it then I'm like oh wait a minute is this you know, because the time is jumping around. So then I have to like, in a paper book, I would actually flip back to the last time I saw a date to see if time has passed or if it's, you know, before then or, you know, and when I'm just reading it digitally, I can't easily do that. So then I am perpetually kind of like wondering until I'm further in to the chapter, where is this and who is this? And again, like that pulls right. me out of the story. So I don't, think that it's a bad idea in totality like i just the date part you know like may 15th yeah. 1972 what's the deal with may 15th 1972 can it just be may 1972 that's right, i think that was right. my, my point and i think where i go with this is that i i feel like it's that's the fine line like for me as a reader like i i, I love the date and time stuff i really do like it's one of my it gives me that level of of reality it it always feels to me like it's it makes the story feel like it's really like real um it didn't work for you um you Sorry. signaled to me hey i like time i like the time stuff when it's important so it, it forced me to make that to to make a different choice um or disregard what you were saying and but and that's every writer's um, yeah right you can always disregard what your editor says i worked with someone who was writing an environmental sci-fi it was it was you know it was right around the time of the um wildfires here in the pacific northwest and you know she opened every chapter with some like kind of weather report it almost felt like the weather report 
mm-hmm. and it lost steam. And I, I think it, it really, the, the book was great, but this opening lost steam. And I don't think she, it, and she didn't know. She, and that's what she came to me for, to learn, you know, does this work or not? So that's what I meant. Like, there's a fine line. Like, it, for her, it worked for the first three or four chapters. And after that, it got, it just didn't work anymore. Monotonous, yeah. Yeah, it just got really... You're hooking the reader. That's the thing we have to remember is we're hooking the reader into the story. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you look at classic, the classic stories, you know, it's the best of times. It was the worst of times. I mean, we don't live in that world anymore where that that, that book is hundreds of years old, but that's a classic line. People remember that line, like the first line of Lolita by Vladimir Navikov. Like they're, you know, they're, poetic lines and maybe that's not what we do anymore but that that you have to you have to bring them in you have to you I think you're you're seducing the reader line by line by line and the first one is the most important sometimes readers are going to put the book down if you can't hook them right away and so that's why of course we're talking about this (laughs) this is why it's important and right and if it falls if the yeah, basically, if you can't have a good beginning, if you can't hook the reader right away, then they're not going to read the book and you can't win them. Like some, sometimes people will be like, well, the book really picks up, you know, a third of the way in and then it's like dynamite. Awesome. Well, then start your book there. Like, <laughs> right? don't don't hope that the reader will just plod through the beginning so they can get to the good part. Like make the beginning the good part so that even if the middle is kind of saggy, like, and there's so many things that can make a good hooky opening for me. Um, Some things, sometimes it doesn't have to be a first line. I love a good first line, but, or a good, at least a good first paragraph. But if that doesn't happen, other things that can hook me are um, the setting. So like if it's a cool historical setting that I like or um or a place in the world where I've not been and I'm interested in or if it's about a um a group of people a community of people that interests me that I don't know a lot about like I don't know for a while I had like this Amish thing (laughs) Jody Pico wrote a book um called Plain Truth Um, that I really loved and it took place in an Amish community. And that was part of the reason why I bought the book because I was like, Ooh, this sounds interesting. I don't know a lot about the Amish. I, I like that. Or I've picked up books because um, of theme. I think that can be a hook too. You know, if, if you read the back of the book, the book description, and it says, you know, covering themes on blah, 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 blah. And I'm interested in one of those themes, then I'll, you know, buy the book. I consider those hooks too. Not necessarily are going to be in the first paragraph, but they're going to be the first chapter. And I guess you you want to make sure that they are. (laughs) Right. I think there's, I, 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 I've, when we came up with this topic, I started thinking about like what the different ways to hook readers. And I, I think that, I think it's, there's narrative voice. Like if you have a unique, like 100% unique narrative voice for your mm-hmm. character, that is a, you want to start with that. I always think the first line to Lolita by Nabokov, you know, Humbert Humbert, the the POV character in that story, you know, Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins. It's like, I'm, I'm reading. I'm here. <laughs> like, what's this? I'm in this care. Yeah. I'm here. And like, so na- if you have this powerful narrative voice, to me, that's that. To me, that's great, um, and and you should you should be leading with that because that's what's going to carry that reader through. You actually said something a, a minute ago about like when people say the book really starts here. Well, that person isn't going to get there without right. something. They were mm-hmm. they were hooked by something. It may have been the narrative voice. Um, I also think you can introduce the whole theme of the story. Um, in that first line, like uh, mm-hmm. those best times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you know, like they think of the beginning of Anna Karenina by Tolstoy, where he it's something about happy families are all alike. Um, 
And I, I'm like, that's an interesting line. Happy families are all alike. It, it, it's a hook. Um, but I think what, where we're, if you're in the genres, it's usually something like, um, it's something odd or curious, right? And, and I'm, I'm trying to pull these from memory, but I think 1984 by George Orwell opens with clock striking 13, like odd or curious, like clocks don't, you know, mm -hmm. cl clocks don't strike 13. So I think there's like different, you can't do that in every paragraph or you can't do that in every scene with something curious like that. I think it would be but exhausting about, if it would. It would be exhausting. It'd be yeah. so exhausting. The pacing would you know, be totally Hobbit. weird. <laughs> my my nine-year-old son could probably like paraphrase the opening of The Hobbit because it just sets that whole like, you know, the hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit and it's this nasty, no, it's not a nasty hole, that kind of thing. Like, uh -huh. So I think- Stephen King, who everybody knows is my guiding light, you know, he says like <laughs> that first lines are invitations. Mm. You're, you're trying to tell the reader that like you you want to see what's in, inside here, and 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 whatever you have that, but that also I think we should shift uh, somewhat and say, well, how do you know what you're inviting people to? Like, is it what what kind of party is your book? Is it a costume party? Is it a, you know, like what is what what is the the party of the book you're inviting people to? I think you have to know. I used to know a writer who would write first lines, mm -hmm. just like write down first like hooky first lines. And I thought that was really cool for a while. And then I realized, but like what good is this first line if I don't know the rest of the story? It has to connect something. Um Right. It has to. Yeah. It, well, I knew some. It has to pay off. Like, and Toni Morrison has a first line that says, I think it says they shoot the white girl first. <laughs> like that book had better pay that off. That story had better <laughs> pay that off because that is a, a huge emotionally packed line. So I, I don't know. I think the hooks are great, but if, if there's nothing behind it, you, you run into trouble. Whole nother topic, I know. Yeah, but. whole other topic. Other things opening wise that I think need to be in mm. there are the protagonist's needs and wants. And let me yeah. put in a caveat there. So opening in this case means the beginning, I guess, of the book to me in this one sentence, <laughs> in this one example. Because by the end of by the end of the chapter, for sure, I need to know who that main character is, why I want to be on a journey with him, and what he's going to go and do. Like, what is it that right. he wants? What is he striving for? Because I need to know if I can get behind whatever that or is. She. Yeah, were they? So whatever yeah. it is that they're striving for, I also need to be willing to go on this journey and strive for that too. I want to be able to root for the main character. So that has to happen right. at the beginning of the book too. Um, right. I'm looking right. at the rubric right now and there's a section in the rubric um, on beginnings and endings that I added. And, and an excellent beginning says that this hook creates an impact on the reader. It stirs up their interest raises anticipation, questions, and curiosity. Readers have a compulsion to get into the book, and the reader is driven to follow the character and see if they get what they want and need. Direct quote from the rubric. So those are all part of openings, beginnings, um, something that's going to hook your reader. Yep. Yep. And, and, I think it's important to, I, I think it's important because we all talk about, we talk about process. Like, I think it's important to be aware of this, but also aware that you might not have the hooky first lines, or you might be working on these elements later in the book than right away. Like if you're sitting at the computer agonizing over a first line and the, you know, the next 40,000 words are simmering on the stove, but you're stuck, you know, you're kind of like trying to figure out that first line. The idea of doing everything chronologically or, or being kind of a slave to, 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 yeah, being a slave to chronology is it, it can get in the way. Like if you know the rest of the book, by all means, go write the rest of the book. Um, 
Yeah, this is a revision understand. thing, you know. Yeah, you may have that first line, right? I mean, you may have, you may have that shocking, funny, you know, great call me Ishmael, Moby Dick first line that you know sets the tone. Uh -huh. That's great. You may have that, but if you don't, but you have. 30,000 other lines, write those 30,000 other lines first. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. get there. I, I, it's, I always think of that just like that sort of myth of the agonizing artist, the agonizing writer who's like trying, you know, trying to create the perfect line of poetry out of thin air. Like sometimes, like we were talking about with titles, that great line, that great moment, that great hook comes later. It does. It does for yeah. me anyway. I don't ever have the first line. <laughs> that is a definitely a revision thing for me. And I don't yeah. have a little, I don't have, I used to have a little notes app thing that, that had a collection of first lines. I don't know what ever happened to that, but yeah, I, every, every once in a while, one will just sort of like drop in like a little, like a, I don't know divine download or something like oh this is a great first line and i'll write it down but you know i i've yet to actually use any of those and i think it's i, I think it's also when you when you talk about having like sort of i don't know i kind of think of it just like like i have a bucket or i have a container i have some, i have something that i put these ideas in it's like the sometimes it's like practicing a sport like if you are a basketball player and you practice six days out of the week, shooting, shoot, taking shots in the front yard, you might've wait. You, you can't look at those shots you're taking in practice as waste. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could maybe write a bunch of first lines and none of those end up anything, but it just, it's priming the mechanism in your brain that gets you thinking in the writers, especially if it's like a voice based first line, right. Or a, a, a voice based manuscript. You know, I think about how much, I mean, Nabokov's a, a, a such a weird example because of just who he was. But, you know, getting to that Humbert Humbert voice that makes Lolita one of the most will never will, will never go out of relevance. Um, he probably had to work on that voice tirelessly to get that down, to really get that distilled line. You know, I think it so. My don't, favorite don't, don't. narrative. um voice that really hooked me into I mean I like a lot of books for their narrative voice but the one that keeps popping back in my head is Motherless Brooklyn by Jonathan Lethem the oh, main yeah. character has Tourette's so the first paragraph is just basically his voice telling you what it's like to have a tick that you're trying to subdue and how it just like explodes out and that was so freaking fascinating to me and i yeah. thought it was written so yeah. well that it was it that was what pulled me through the rest of the book which was just you know kind of a generic mystery who killed this dude right. but right but the narrative voice was so compelling i've read that book like three times just for the voice i really liked it other and, and for first, me oh, go ahead Oh, I was going to say for me, I've, I've probably read The Catcher in the Rye like, I don't know, five times in my life. And it's always the voice. I mean, uh, Holden Caulfield, that voice is just amazing. And that first line, you know, if you really want to hear about it, I'm reading this. I'm not, I'm not, this is not from memory, but it, he says, if you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. Like, <laughs> all right, I'm I, I'm here. You know, my I just read that and I like my legs got like the hair raised on my yeah. neck and my back. Like I'm uh -huh. like, I could go read this right now. Um, yeah. I also really liked um speaking of like a setting opening, Shantaram. Have you read that book? David no. Roberts I forgot his it's a three word, a three name name. There's David Gregory and there's David Roberts. Roberts. What is it? Gregory David Roberts. Yes, there we go. Um, I'm reading that also. I didn't know that off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> but Shantram opens, like the first um, paragraph or two is all about setting in Bombay and like landing 
you know, at the airport and walking out into India and Bombay and it, the smells, I mean, you could, the, he did such a brilliant job of setting the, the stage in terms of, um, well, setting like the world building, you know, like I can smell in that first chapter in that first page. I mean, what it smelled like when, he, and, and that's not a, a sense that usually I get a lot of from, from writing. Cause you know, we are such a visual, um, group of people, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, humans are visual. Yep. So yeah. it was great. If you like India and you like epic long tales, it's a big doorstopper of a book, but it's got great characters and I, I recommend it. And I mean, I know that the I have, I've read the first of the Master and Commander books. Those like people love that stuff because it's so technical. Um, that book kind of opens with a very when you talked about like introduction by setting. Like you were in the first paragraph of that book, you are in the a seaport in the time. You could smell it, taste it, feel it. It was all right there. It's not even my favorite kind of writing, mm -hmm. um, but I was just like you cannot, I, I challenge you not to get immersed into that. I challenge you. It's not possible to, to resist it. It's too powerful. It's a I, constant conversation in my writer's group because, you know, the transition is, and, and this is another, a whole nother topic and maybe we shouldn't even go the, much further than this, but like transitions are the same things. It's like you're transitioning from scene to scene and it's another opening line. It's another hook. It's another introduction of setting we talked about this like it's you're, you're so you're constantly having to do this you're constantly having to um you're you know re-invite your reader in because mm -hmm. count how many times you pick up your book like yeah. i probably have picked up the institute 10 times and i have to be reintroduced to it i have to be like re-engaged in it and so yeah that's a really good point and i also like the, i we didn't mention this or maybe we did but this the story as a promise um you know when you're when you're opening up the book and you're starting to read those first few lines you are like you said getting to know like what party are you being invited to like what is what are you promising the reader what is what is what is coming up and right and being able right. to um they, they also have a couple of um I don't know, technique. I don't know if that's the right word, but I like the kinds of openings where they start really broad and then narrow the focus of the camera into like this person, you know, like you're oh, yeah. in a town, you're on a street, you're in a house, you're in a yard, you're in the, you know what I mean? That telescoping or reverse telescoping, I guess, as an opening technique, I like. And I also right. have heard um, about being able to, like, however it is that you start your book, also ending your book kind of in the same way, like sort of a mirror mm. image or like a book, like a bookend mm. that that gives the reader yeah. you no know, satisfaction. I don't know if, if that could be true for, for every type of book, but those are also. Well, I think there is, I mean, that gets into cinema. That's a very cinematic mm -hmm. sort of uh element of that like the opening image and closing image should you know one should resolve the other um right if the first image is of like a of a wrecked city and a, a young girl crawling out of the muck then you should you're resolving the idea of this is the so whatever that opening that if that's your opening your ending should resolve you know her role in that city that city itself whatever that element is that you're trying to you know whatever the story journey um yeah now right. we're getting into screenplays yeah <laughs> which, which is which i'm fine with but yeah well so our listeners could be writing screenplays so it's always good to touch on that too but Hopefully all right i think we've said everything that we have to say about first yeah. lines openings and hooks and and if you've got any other tips for us, you can drop those in the Facebook group or or comment on this podcast episode. 
and uh, keep the conversation going. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for chatting with me this week and I'll see you Absolutely. next time. Bye Talk for now. To you soon.